everyone. My name is Layla Brown and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in English at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And today I'm presenting a talk that I've called Ann Pancakes Appalachia, Literary Re Regionalism and the Extractive Ordinary. Perhaps paralleling the recent planetary turn in literary scholarship, various critics have recently evinced a sense of skepticism about realism's ability to engage substantively with climate crisis. Since Frederick Jameson called realism a, quote, strategy of containment, end quote, in the political unconscious, eco-critics have extended this argument to more explicitly environmental concerns. Amitav Ghosh, for instance, has written that the Anthropocene's, quote, essence consists of phenomena that were long ago expelled from the territory of the novel, forces of unthinkable magnitude that create unbearably intimate connections over vast gaps in time and space, end quote. His argument is a literary historical one, identifying the realist novel's historical fidelity to probability and to the, quote, regularity of bourgeois life, end quote, as that which renders it incapable of grappling with ecological disasters that exceed the organized strata of everyday life. Timothy Clark, in Ecocriticism on the Edge, argues that contemporary novels are stymied by their recourse to, quote, intellectual miniaturization the aesthetic, dramatic, and narrative constraints of presenting things in some easily apprehensible empirical scenario." End quote. Adam Trexler, meanwhile, in his ambitious cataloging of Anthropocene fictions, acknowledges that experimental realisms may have something to contribute to the emergent genre, but comments that, quote, to the extent that the literary novel about contemporary society is set in bourgeois spaces, it seems all but unable to register the different scales of climate change, end quote. The Anthropocene, after all, is a crisis of scale. Timothy Morton calls it a hyperobject, or that which is so, quote, massively dispersed in time and space, end quote, as to defy conceptualization altogether. These critics, Morton notwithstanding, advance a model of climate representation that demands a fairly explicit and nearly didactic form of engagement with environmental crisis. Anne Pancake's 2007 Appalachia set novel, Strange as This Weather Has Been, does in some ways approach the didacticism that Ghosh, Clark, and Trexler endorse. Set in the lightly fictionalized Yellow Root Hollow, West Virginia, the novel's point of environmental engagement is the form of coal mining known as mountaintop removal. Mountaintop removal involves, as the name suggests, blasting away mountaintops to gain access to coal seams that would otherwise be difficult to reach. Before mining can even begin, the process entails. Sorry, quick problem with the microphone. The process entails a clear cutting mountaintop forests, removing layers of topsoil, and filling neighboring valleys with blasted away earth and rock. In addition to its obvious relation to anthropogenic climate change through the burning of fossil fuels. Mountaintop removal engenders habitat loss through clear cutting and valley dumps. Additionally, the attendant coal slurry dams are unstable and particularly vulnerable to wastewater flooding. Pancake's novel, as various critics have recognized, exposes not only the ecological costs of mountaintop removal, but also its social embeddedness within a complex social and economic web of Appalachian communities. Scholars have cited the novel's, quote, documentary function, end quote, its depiction of, quote, activism as a process of making visible, end quote, or even explicitly its didacticism. I recognize this didactic tendency of Strange as This Weather Has Been and suggest that Pancake's realist novel offers an example of the kind of literary engagement with global warming for which Ghosh calls. But I am also interested in the novel's subtler engagement with environmental catastrophe, the way in which it also belies a spectacular or event-based understanding of environmental catastrophe, so as to amplify what Rob Nixon has termed slow violence or temporalities of anticipation and attrition that are sutured to ordinary life. In situating the multiple temporalities of mountaintop removal within the texture of the ordinary, Pancake's novel lends extraction as a form of environmental violence that shuttles between the catastrophic and the ordinary to reveal the imbrication of these two modes. In making this argument about temporality, I moreover want to suggest that Strange as This Weather Has Been locates itself within a tradition of literary regionalism and explores the possibilities for an, quote, environmental imagination, end quote, therein. 
It thus points to the necessity when evaluating the limitations and possibilities of a climate realism of engaging a particular and historically grounded strand of the genre instead of realism writ large. American literary realism and Appalachia have a particularly strong, if vexed, relationship. Appalachia played a prominent role in the 19th century local color literary movement, a movement that itself, as Emily Satterwhite writes, contributed to the, quote, invention of Appalachia, end quote. Indeed, the name Appalachia itself emerged from local color writing. Satterwhite writes that literary regionalism produced an idealized image of Appalachia as rooted in static, authentic and untouched by global currents. Conversely, as Sarah Robertson notes, such literature has also produced a more sinister version, vision of Appalachia through implotments of feuding families and moonshine drinking hillbillies. There is an interesting and important production of whiteness at play in literary regionalism, and in particular in Appalachia set local color, but it's beyond the scope of this paper to address it here. Strange as this weather has been takes up many familiar perspectives and use of dialect. And as the novel's foregrounding of everyday life coalesces with what June Howard recognizes as characteristic of contemporary regionalisms, she writes that narratives focalized through mo multiple perspectives show the depth of thought and emotion people experience in everyday, apparently simple activities. The everyday is often exalted, end quote. Pan takes literary regionalism in turn structures its particular formulations of temporality, suggesting that regionalism offers a potent and underrecognized strategy for literary engagement with anthropogenic environmental crisis. It is perhaps not surprising that Strange as This Weather Has Been is a novel about time. Howard, for one, recognizes the imbrication of place and time, which she terms place time, in her study of regionalism writing that, quote, the chronotope of realism entails a relationship to the past, end quote. Meanwhile, the cultural imaginary of the United States often invokes the pastness and authenticity of Appalachia so as to construct, variously, the comparatively progressive time of urban centers or white nostalgia for putative simplicity and innocence. Appalachia, Robertson writes, is a, quote, place believed to follow different temporal paths than the rest of the nation, end quote. And finally, Pancake's own scholarly research primarily concerns the relationship between social class and temporality. In what follows, I will explore the ways in which the regionalism of Strange as This Weather Has Been activates multiple registers of environmental time. One trope of literary regionalism is the visitor, often from a city, who observes the interactions and rhythms of an apocryphally simpler community. Sarah Orne Jewett's 1896 novel, The Country of the Pointed Furs, a key regionalist text, is a classic example here. Pancake revises this trope in the character of Avery, or Bucky, a young man who has since fled Yellow Root Hollow in search of upward mobility, and who returns to West Virginia to visit his mother. Avery's narrative, which unfolds in an extended chapter about two thirds of the way into the novel, reveals that he experienced the catastrophic Buffalo Creek flood of 1972. The core event of Strange as This Weather has been, the real life Buffalo Creek disaster occurred when a coal slurry impoundment dam managed by the Pittston Coal Company burst. The breakage pro produced a massive flood of black wastewater that killed 125 people and displaced thousands. So when scholars and critics identify the didacticism of Pancake's novel, they frequently focus on Avery's narrative. In Matthew Henry's words, it renders mountaintop removable, it renders mountaintop removal narratable as quote, visual spectacle, end quote. The Buffalo Creek flood registers in the text as what I call traumatic time. It is a spectacular disaster that returns in belated form. To follow Kathy Carruth's influential formulation of trauma as quote, not locatable in the simple violent or original event in an individual's past, but rather in the way that it's very unassimilated nature, the way it was precisely not known in the first instance, returns to haunt the survivor later on. Pancake follows the structure of the traumatic event, both representationally and formally. Reading about disaster liability as a student, Avery, quote, gradually became conscious of his own body, not the 27-year-old body cramped in the carol, but his 12-year-old body, the memory battered into that. 
The disaster was carved into his body like grooves in a phonographic record. And the page about the prices, they played his skin back. The anachronism of trauma, the way in which the return of the repressed memory interrupts the present, unfolds in Avery's return to his 12-year-old body. But Pancake, as I've mentioned, also engages traumatic time on a formal level. As Avery's chapter unfolds well into the novel, it retrospectively illuminates the way in which the aftermath of Buffalo Creek structures the other perspectives. In readerly terms, knowledge of the flood makes a belated return. Avery's memory of the flood returns to the present tense, quote, he wakes there on the ice crusty dead leaves, that cold rain still drizzling down, but what he feels first, more than cold, fear, or panic, is shame over his near nakedness. Then he realizes he is cold dirt all over, end quote. While Pancake narrates the other characters who directly engage mountaintop removal through the past tense, here she interrupts that pattern with the intrusion of present tense traumatic time. In activating a structure of traumatic time, in Strange as This Weather Has Been, Pancake gestures to the possibility that realism, in fact, can reckon with spectacular disasters of anthropogenic harm, although perhaps not in quite um, the bourgeois legacy that the critics with which I began this paper identified. More precisely, though, she revises the regionalist trope of the outside visitor so as to question the stereotype of Appalachian authenticity and temporal boundedness. As Avery grapples with his memories of the flood while moving between West Virginia, Cleveland, and Washington State, Appalachia's position in his memory is traumatic rather than salvific. Traumatic time, however, by no means indexes the only or even the primary way in which the novel grapples with environmental crisis. The subtler and more diffuse models of environmental time that Pancake limbs, particularly when read alongside Avery's account of Buffalo Creek, point to regionalism's capaciousness as an Anthropocene fiction. If Howard notes that regionalism features, unquote, intensely local focus and episodic form, foregrounding atmosphere and a web of relationships rather than plot, strange as this weather has been, take such relationships as a foundation for an interpersonal, even transcorporeal in Stacey Alamo's sense, ecological ethic. Dane, a 12-year-old boy whose emotional sensitivity and implied sexuality put him at odds with the codes of masculinity at play in his family, does paid domestic labor for an elderly woman named Mrs. Taylor. Their conversations as Dane cleans and cooks for Mrs. Taylor transmit a sense of intergenerational memory regarding the Buffalo Creek flood. Quote, all those months before May, while he and Mrs. Taylor sat in the living room between chores, Mrs. Taylor talked of any number of things. But since the May flood, she speaks of only three. Her kids wanting her to move to Cleveland. What happened at Buffalo Creek? And less often, more hushed, the upcoming end of the world. Ever since then, day after day in the darkened house, while Dane cleans or between chores, Mrs. Taylor tells the horrors of Buffalo Creek, February 26, 1972. And she doesn't tell them as history or legend. She tells them as prophecy, threat. Here, the memory of the Buffalo Creek flood manifests not as traumatic time as it does for Mrs. Taylor's son Avery, but rather as anticipatory time, the prophecy and threat of impoundment dam collapse mark an apocalypse that has already occurred and is coming again. While Avery's traumatic experience is a largely solipsistic one, moreover, the relationship between Mrs. Taylor and Dane is structured not only by didacticism, but also by co-created conversation and the rhythms of domestic labor. Dane's later chapters find him wracked with anxiety, localizing Mrs. Taylor's sense of impending disaster. God's trying to tell us something, Mrs. Taylor will, mur will murmur, shaking a finger towards her roof, and beyond that, the valley, fill, the mine. God's telling us something. Such warnings circulate in Dane's mind as he, quote, lies in the extra dark of the bottom bunk, his insides flipping, a nausea of fish swimming. All day, it has looked like rain. If the most acute possibility of disaster comes in periods of heavy rain, as in the Buffalo Creek flood, for instance, the impoundment dam collapsed during such weather, Dane learns from Mrs. Taylor to keep one eye on the sky. Pancake references the threat of rain several times throughout Strange as this weather has been. This is, writes Henry, quote, a narrative tick that betrays a growing awareness of characters' residence in a sacrificial landscape. Of course, the weather indexes not only the possibility of dam collapses and wastewater floods, but also an awareness of climate more broadly. 
As the title of the novel suggests, Pancake links the phenomenon of strange unseasonable weather to the multiple temporalities of mountaintop removal, thus placing the local narrative of Yellow Root Hollow in relation to broader flows of climate and capital. Theodore Martin suggests that weather indexes what he calls a thinkable time scale for climate change insofar as the weather marks the present. He comments that, quote, when it rains or snows, we know what now means. And when it snows in June or fails to in January, we know, or we think we know, that something about the now is different, off kilter, altered. But weather in Pancake's novel carries not only a sense of the now, but also an index of past and future catastrophe. And she situates it within the social webs familiar to readers of literary regionalism. The novel, in turn, suggests an anticipatory and socially constituted sense of ecological crisis that complicates the primacy of the spectacular event. Alongside the belated rupture of traumatic time and the multiple apocalypses of anticipatory time, strange as this weather has been also evokes subtler temporalities of attrition and residue. As with the anticipatory, Pancake situates attritional and residual time within a web of relationships, both human and non-human. Satterwhite writes in her study of the reception of Appalachia set fiction, the regionalist stories, quote, offered solace to readers who hoped for the persistence of a place characterized by unalienated relations among people, between people and the land, and between people and the vibrancy of real life purportedly missing from modern and postmodern life. Pancake rewrites this convention, however, confronting the way in which that apocryphally unspoiled land is irrevocably damaged, a seemingly isolated slice of rural life thrown starkly into the global flow of fossil fuel and capital. Although events like Buffalo Creek can construe a sense of environmental disaster as spectacle, temporalities of attrition and residue located in everyday and barely perceptible terms. As one character, Bant, the teenage girl around whom much of the novel revolves, spends time with extended family, a sense of ecological loss emerges in their conversations. When I least expected it, one of them would mention another thing lost. Honeybees, a ginseng patch, a type of tree. When they do that, I'd pull in on myself. I'd drop my head. The pretty sandy spot on the river we used to call the beach, they'd say. Crawdads, Helgramates, they said it like somebody was dying and others had already died, quiet and prayerful and sad they spoke in. This loss situates environmental degradation as attritional and ongoing, marked not only by species knowledge of insects like honeybees and Helgramites, but also of particular locations, a particular ginseng patch, a particular sandy spot on the river they used to call the beach. Grounded in everyday observation and seasonal time, just a few pages earlier, Bant describes a practice of tracking the seasons as she forages on the mountains. Such attritional loss remains located in everyday perception and subjective experience. For a long time, reflects one character, it was the trees dying scared me most. I don't mean how they clear cut the mountains before they blow them up, although of course that's an awful thing, but that is a thing you can see and understand. What scared me most was the trees that are slow dying. You don't really notice, that's why it's scariest, until one day it just dawns on you. How long's it been since I seen a mulberry tree, a butternut? Ain't there more logs th down there than there used to be, or am I just nervous? What happened to that sugar tree used to be at the head of Nell's Hollow just five years ago? The scariest is when things are lost before you know you're losing. Explicitly distinguishing between the spectacular nature of the clear cutting and blasting away of mountaintops that precedes strip mining and the slow violence of ecological attrition, he frames the latter with an epistemology of not noticing instead of visibility and exposure. And the belated realization of disaster structures itself not through the temporal rupture of traumatic time, but rather through a gradual recognition that situates itself in everyday life and the particular places and rhythms of lived experience down there, that sugar tree. Disrupting the association between Appalachian literary regionalism and the projection of social and ecological authenticity therein, Pancake foregrounds the attritional change that coal mining, and in particular mountaintop removal, has wrought upon the region. Why regionalism? Why here? Beyond the intervention that Pancake makes in dispelling some of the pervasive myths of Appalachia as alternately home to moonshining and feuding hillbillies or to bluegrass music, quilts, and the simple life, myths that literary regionalism itself was foundational and codifying. Strange as this weather has been, suggests that regionalism's local focus 
and amplification of social webs and everyday life in turn offers a kind of ecological multi-temporality. More specifically, a close attention to what Bant calls, quote, the deep of here, end quote, enables a consideration of the anticipatory and attritional temporalities of mountaintop removal that include, but also exceed the spectacular narratability of catastrophes like the Buffalo Creek flood. As it holds together both traumatic time and the temporality of slow violence, Pancake offers a form of literary regionalism in which everydayness and political economy meet. The novel's activation and revision of regionalist tropes then has some affinity with what Stephanie Le Menager calls commodity regionalism, an investment in quote, local ecologies and materials that makes explicit modernity's spatial logics, end quote. To return to the eco-critical antipathy toward realism with which I began this paper then, an antipathy that I suggested was foundationally premised on the scalar logics that the realist novel is simply too constrained, too overdetermined to grapple with that which is diffuse in time and space. Perhaps Pancake's novel re reveals that the temporal, geographical, and scalar unit of region offers a way out of this impasse. If critics such as Ghosh demand that literary and critical practitioners scale up their unit of analysis, Howard suggests that region as a keyword, quote, can disrupt the habit of arraying place categories into an overly abstract hierarchy of scale. And implicitly offering region as a unit of analysis that is simultaneously local and global, bounded and relational, strange as this weather has been, also limits the possibilities of literary regionalism in apprehending climate as a necessary, proximate, and partial task. Thank you. And here is my work cited page. I look forward to engaging with people about this work. Um, and thanks again for watching.